So if you ever bit into a lemon before, yes, you ever like ate a lemon? Uh, now, unless you're kind of like a strange group of people that genuinely likes to eat lemons, most of us might like lemons in water, we might put lemons on food, but most of us are not gonna just straight up eat lemons because lemons are sour. So anytime, and if you're a parent, you haven't truly lived as a parent until you make your kids eat lemons just for the fun of it. It doesn't hurt them, it doesn't harm them, but man, you get a good kick and laugh out of it. So if you've ever watched a kid take a bite out of a lemon, you get the lemon look, right? Everybody knows the lemon look is, it's that one. Right, just your lips get all tied and your eyes scrunch together and just like your whole body gets real tense because oh, it's, it's like, no, it's, it's, it's terrible. It's not what you should just eat and it's just oh, nasty. That's the lemon look. And if I, if I were to ask you to think back, because I've seen that look multiple times outside of just eating lemons. If I were to ask you to think back to your most recent terrible day, how's that for an encouraging, encouraging start to a sermon on Sunday morning? Think back to your most recent terrible day. And if you were to start talking through the things of that day, I would probably sense if we were sitting having this conversation, you probably would have had the same look. Like, oh man, I woke up late, lemon look. Then I went out and there was traffic, lemon look. Go through the whole thing and I forgot my lunch, lemon look. There was, I didn't have my wallet. I mean, you could go through a whole list of why it was a terrible day and all your lemon looks throughout that day. There's a common phrase, I'm sure you know it, when life gives you lemons, what? Make lemonade. Make lemonade, that's right. Now there's only one place I know that makes the best lemonade, God's lemonade, thank you. I'm glad I didn't have to explain that one. Now for them it's very easy, for Chick-fil-A it's very easy, and they even take great pride in this, that their lemonade consists of lemons, water and sugar, and that's it. And you take lemons and it most certainly turns into lemonades, but I'm convinced life's not that easy <laughs> because life most certainly does hand us lemons, the difficulties, the moments of adversary, the, the struggles, the issues, the problems. And we joke about having a bad day and giving lemon looks, but then there's those lemons that, that give more than just a look, like it, it changes and devastates your life. Walking through a divorce, losing a loved one, losing a job, starting a career, but then it doesn't work out, financial problems, debt, you name it, and those lemons are a little bit different, aren't they? It's harder to laugh about those, but still, life hands us lemons. And as much as I love that phrase, and I heard it growing up, when life gives you lemons, just make lemonade out of it. It's a great, catchy saying, but I'm not always sure we know how to do that. Because it's not just about being overly positive. It's not just saying, well, be optimistic. It's not just saying it could be worse. It's not just saying, well, it'll get better. There might be some truth to that, but I don't think that's how you truly make lemonade, if you will. It's not wishing away or ignoring the realities. It's not looking at the lemon and says, oh, no, no, you, that's not a lemon. That's an apple. That's not helpful. No, it's the problems that you deal with are real problems. The issues that you're facing are real issues. The struggles that you're dealing with are real. So when life gives you lemons, what are we supposed to do with them? That's the question I want us to wrestle with over the next two weeks. We're gonna do a mini series that is all about lemons. I think this will help get our, get our minds maybe focused in the right direction on what this looks like. Viktor Frankl gave a great quote. I think it's gonna give us some very helpful insight as we dig into God's word this morning. He said this, when we are no longer able to change the situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. I love that. Listen to it again. When we are no longer to change the situation, the environment around us, the lemons that we have been handed, when we are no longer in control of all of that, well, what do we do? According to him, he encourages us. He says he's challenging us to change ourselves. When you can't do anything about out there, well, what do we do about in here? If you don't know who Viktor Frankl is, I think this is what gives his statement, his quote, so much credibility. It's not what he said, but who he was and what he lived through. 
He was a psychologist, which makes sense based on his quote, but he was also a Holocaust survivor that had to live that out. And if you ever read his story, it's a story of letting go of the control that he cannot control, but taking control of what he could. Faith, response, reaction, attitude, mindset, hopes. That's what we can hold on to. So when life gives you lemons, let's figure out how to make lemonade with them. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you so much for what you can teach us. You say that your word is useful, it's helpful to challenge us and to change us and to guide us and to lead us. So I pray that's what happens this week and next week especially. As we try to figure out not necessarily what the lemons are of our life, we all deal with difficulties, we all have struggles, but help us to wrestle with the question and God give us the wisdom and the clarity of the answer of what we're supposed to do with them, what to do when life hands each of us lemons. In Jesus' name, amen. So to do that, to walk through this mini-series over the next two weeks, we're gonna be looking at the life of Joseph, not Joseph, earthly father of Jesus Joseph. No, this is Joseph, Old Testament Joseph. He had a coat of many, do you know this? Coat of many colors, yes, exactly. So in Genesis chapter 37, if you got your Bible, head there. We are gonna go through his story, identify some of the lemons that he was handed, but more importantly, more importantly, I want us to figure out how he handled it, what he did with them, how he walked through life when life handed him, him lemons. Now, Joseph's story is a long story, chapter 37 all the way through Genesis chapter 50. You don't want to be here from Genesis 37 to 50 today. So we're going to split it up. We're going to look at one part this morning. We're going to look at the second part next week and see how he walked through it. But to give you a heads up, to be a little bit of a spoiler for even next week, we're going to see four lemons that life hands Joseph. The first one we're going to see is that of disappointment, the lemon of disappointment. Then we're going to see betrayal. We're going to see people close to him betray him, actually do more than just betray him. We'll look at that today. The next week, we're going to see two more lemons of unfair, the lemon of fair and unfair, as well as forgotten and isolation. So let's look at those first two this morning. Again, the question we're wrestling with is, what do we do when life hands us lemons? Here's the story at least the first part. Genesis chapter 37, we're gonna start in verse five, and this story picks up Joseph. He is one of a total of 12 brothers, and he is the favorite, and his father makes it known that he's the favorite. How many of you are the favorite of the family? I have my hand raised, so I am too. If my sister's watching, sorry about your luck. <laughs> no, she lives closer, so she's the favorite, but it's known that Joseph is the favorite. That's why he got that coat of many colors. He's 17, when this happens, verse five, Joseph had a dream and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more, such siblings. Verse six, he said to them, listen to this dream I have had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. That's a great story to tell your brothers, especially when you're one of the younger ones. Verse eight, his brother said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Now, it's good to notice that it started, this whole story started with his brothers hating him all the more. And then he told them about his dream and they hated him even more for it. So it's obvious his brothers don't like, they hate Joseph. So Joseph does what any good young brother does. He tells them another dream that he had. Verse nine, then he had another dream and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream. He didn't pick up on what happens every time he shares his dreams yet. At this, and this time, the sun and the moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father, as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, are you kidding me? No, that's not exactly it. What is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? Goes on, talks about how jealous his brothers were and they hated him even more. Understand Joseph's situation. He was given a dream. It wasn't just a dream, it was a God-given dream. It was a vision of what was to happen, of what was to come. And he didn't just get one of these, he got two of these, uh, confirming and affirming where God was leading Joseph, what he was gonna do in his life. Now, Joseph, I most certainly think, could have used a little bit of humility in how he handled sharing these dreams. It's not a good idea to go and boast to your brothers that you're eventually gonna rule over them one day, says God. But there's excitement there. 
For Joseph, it's God spoke to me. God, the, the God that all of our family and the history of our family of generations that we've worshipped, we've heard the stories, and he's, he's actually talking to me. And he's telling me what he's going to do in my life. Like, when you frame it up like that, that's exciting for Joseph. And what do his brothers say? Are you kidding me? Why are you telling us this? His father rebukes him. The brothers are jealous and hate him all the more. He has a dream. He has a vision that no one else is excited about. Lemon number one, disappointment. Disappointment. Disappointment happens when, when you live here and nothing and no one else do. When you have an expectation that is not met. When you have an excitement that no one else shares. When you have an idea that no one cares about. When you live here and no one else does. It's even worse when you live here and everybody is like, how dare you live there? How dare you be excited about that? What were you thinking? Do you really think that's gonna happen? Who are you to say this? He had a dream, he had hope, he had excitement, he had joy, and no one else shared that with him. He was rebuked for it. Limit number one, disappointment. Becky had a birthday. My wife had a birthday. I won't tell you what number birthday we shared. I don't have permission to tell about that part of this story. But we celebrated her birthday last weekend, and over 12 years of marriage, I have learned over the years, and I will admit, I am still learning as all husbands should. There's a little side nugget for you. But I've learned over the last 12 years that Becky and I view birthdays very differently. I view birthdays as another day for that person to choose where they want to eat. That's about the extent of how I view birthdays. <laughs> what do you want to do on your birthday? I don't know, the same thing we did yesterday, but I get to pick dinner tonight. That's about it. And that's not coming from a bad place. I had great birthdays growing up. I wasn't, wasn't like abused as a child and birthdays and all that. No, it was like, no, birthdays are not a bad thing. It's just like, it's another day. Why spend extra money on it, right? That's me. Just call me Scrooge if you want to. It's not the first time I've heard it. My wife, on the other hand, birthdays are the day. She goes out of her way. When our kids have birthdays, they are themed. And we do all these parties, and we get the streamers and the decorations, and it all matches. And trust me, it is an amazing day. If something ever happens to her, the worst part in our house is my kids are going to be disappointed when it comes to birthdays because mom's not around to do what she normally does for birthdays. She's, they're stuck with dad. The birthdays that she puts on are awesome. The things that she's done for me on my birthday are incredible. And then it gets to be her birthday where I'm in charge. And she sets me up well. Like, she's not high maintenance. She's not all needy about it. She just says, remember what our family does for birthdays. <laughs> and I'm like, I hear you, but I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> so trust me, man. The phrase that I always go back to time and time again is, I'll tell her, and I said this. I said, Becky, remember, it's the thought that counts. I just say it over and over again. Hey, regardless how the day goes, remember, it's the thought that counts. Regardless of what happens, remember, it's the thought that counts. Because I really do put a lot of thought and effort into it, but it's just really hard <laughs> for me to meet those expectations on her birthday. So we went all out the best that I knew how to go all out. I mean, if you follow me on social, you might have seen some of this. We had four confetti cannons for her birthday this year. We had a balloon drop in our house for her birthday. We had the streamers and we had the decorations. We had the cake from Publix, which is her favorite cake. We did all of this stuff for her birthday. We bought the presents for her birthday, which was my biggest concern. Because she asked me a couple weeks prior, she's like, you good for the birthday? Do you need any direction for the birthday? And I'm like, I think the right answer is no, but I kind of want to say yes. She's like, presents, are you good there? I said, ah, I'm totally good there. She's like, I'll send you a list just in case. And I got that list. I said, I don't need your list. I know you. I know what you love. I'm your husband. I'm going to take good care of you. So me and the kids, we went out and we bought her three presents for her birthday. And she opened those presents and like a great wife, she smiled at all of those three presents. And I stand before you today confessing that out of those three presents, she has returned two out of those three presents. <laughs> the one that she did not return was one of the ones on her list. <laughs> The other two were not bad, but she's like, I'll get something else. But Brian, it was a nice thought. Now, she wasn't disappointed per se because she was able to return them and get what she wanted. 
but it didn't match an expectation. And we all experience that to some degree, don't we? We all experience disappointment when we have an expectation, when we have a hope, when we have a dream, when we have a wish, and it doesn't happen. For Joseph, he had a dream and he had a hope, and it was not the current reality. Disappointment. Lemon number one, disappointment. Let's see what happens next. So his brothers heard all about his dream two times, two different dreams, and then they see, his, they see their brother, Joseph, walking towards them. They're out in the fields. You can pick it up a little bit later in chapter 37. Here's where we're going to pick it up in verse 39. I'm sorry, verse 19. Here comes that dreamer, his brother said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. Now, we need to stop just for a moment and talk about sibling rivalry here. This is a little extreme. Can we all agree on that one? They obviously don't like him. It's no secret that they don't like him. They hated him all the more. We've read that same line twice. But now they're going to take it to, obviously, an extreme level. Verse 23, here's what happened. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the richly ornamented robe he was wearing, the one of many colors, and they took him and threw him into the cistern. The cistern was empty, so there was no water in it. Verse 26. Judah, one of his brothers, said to the other brothers, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. You gotta laugh at this part. Here they were first gonna kill him, and then they decided, well, let's just throw him in a cistern to die, basically. We'll tell dad that an animal ate him, But then one of the nicer brothers said, let's pause and reflect on this for a moment. We don't gain anything if he just dies. Let's sell him and get something out of it. Plus, he is our family. I mean, he is our brother. Surely it wouldn't be right of us to kill him. Selling him, that makes much more sense. Call him the compassionate one out of the other brothers. So that's what they decided to do. They sold him instead of leaving him for dead. They sold him to the Ishmaelites, and as we'll see later, the Ishmaelites then sell him to a man in Egypt. Lemon number two, betrayal. Betrayal. Betrayal, the definition is someone that betrays your confidence, someone that breaks your trust, and it happens on both sides. And I would guess, if I were to guess, You and I have experienced betrayal more than we realize, and we have betrayed others more than we realize. Betrayal is a pretty heavy word. We don't use it lightly. It's not an everyday conversation. But when you give the definition of it's, if I were to give you trust and you break that trust, that's betrayal. If you were to put confidence in me and expected me to do something, to to make good on a promise, and I don't follow through, betrayal. So we all experience that. People break promises. People break trust intentionally and unintentionally. People break confidence intentionally and unintentionally. We're not perfect. We don't always do what we say. We don't always do what we thought we originally could do. And we experience betrayal. They did uh, a a research group, did a fascinating project studying betrayal and the effects that it has on the human soul. And they did this in a, in a fascinating way. They took different individuals and then they brought people close to them and then further and further away from them, relationally speaking. So, for example, I would have an experiment done with me where it would be a stranger would betray me and then there would be a bunch of questions on how it made me feel. Then it would be like an acquaintance that betrayed and how did it make you feel? All the way down to people that are most closest to you and you probably know where this is going. Those closest to you, it hurts the worst, doesn't it? Yeah, a stranger betrays you, it's, well, I don't really know you, maybe it upsets me, but it doesn't, it doesn't impact your soul like it does when those closest to you betray you. And here, Joseph has experienced betrayal at the deepest level because it's his family. Again, it's no secret that his brothers didn't like him, but it's still family. Surely there's a line somewhere that you don't cross, even as family, And surely somewhere on the other side of that line is leaving somebody for dead in a pit or selling them to somebody else. Like, surely that's a line you don't cross. We might fight, we might disagree, and we might struggle to get along, but we're still family. And here, Joseph has experienced betrayal on an entirely new level, a much deeper level. So he experiences, at least so far in this story, we'll pick up the next two next week, two lemons, 
disappointment, and betrayal. And what's interesting about his story, and if you keep reading through Joseph's story like we'll be doing, there's a lot of things you would expect to find that you will not find. Again, when life hands you lemons, we're asking the question, what do we do with them? How do we turn it into lemonade? When life hands you lemons, I want you to think of what you typically do. What is a normal response? Like I said, some of those normal responses are you just ignore it. I don't know what lemon you're talking about. And you're just kind of blind eye. You just try to keep moving forward. Sometimes we do try to wish it away and say, well, it's not a lemon. That's something else. It's not really a problem. It's not really an issue. No, it's not a big struggle. We try to just wish it away and change the reality, even though that doesn't really work. Sometimes it changes our attitude and our behaviors. We begin to isolate ourselves. We become very bitter. If you've been betrayed once, twice, three times, if you continue to experience betrayal and you don't handle it in the right way, you begin to say, that's it. I'm never trusting anybody again. I've had my heart broke too many times. I've been hurt too many times. I've had confidence lost too many times. So you know what my solution is? I just won't trust anybody. I won't put any confidence. I won't ask anybody for anything. You become very isolated to an unhealthy level. If you get disappointed over and over and over again, you don't handle it the right way, you become very bitter, hopeless. Well, if my dreams never come true, then why even have them? Why put my hope in anything? Because it's not going to ever happen. It's not working right now. So why would it ever work later? That tends to be how we naturally handle the lemons of life. There's another way that we handle it. I don't know if it's so much handle it, but respond to it. So we ask a question, a big question. Why? Why did I get handed this lemon? If I'm in Joseph's shoes, I'm asking that question a lot. Why would I be given a dream that never comes true? Why, God, would you give me this hope and this vision if nobody around me is encouraging me, supporting me, and celebrating along with me? God, why even bother to experience betrayal, to ask, why would you put me in a family like this? Why would you give me brothers that want to do nothing but kill me? Why would you give me a father that treats me in this way? Why would you allow this to happen to me? I thought I was going to be a ruler. I thought I was going to be a leader. I thought you were going to do something significant in my life. But here I am, stripped and in a hole alone. Why? Oh, I'm getting pulled out of the hole. Great. Thanks, God, for, oh, wait, I'm being sold. Why? Why? goes on and on and on. You would expect to look at Joseph's story and we would expect to find the question, why God and why me throughout his story? Yet you never see the question. From Genesis 37 all the way through Genesis 50 of Joseph's story, you never see the question, why God and why me? It's fascinating to me because we ask the why question a lot. Now here, let me talk about why for a second. It's not a bad question, I just don't think it's a helpful question. There's nothing wrong with asking why, but it doesn't do anything with the lemons. It doesn't change them, it doesn't change me. There's not really a good answer. Even if there was a good answer, you're not gonna like the answer. So even though why isn't a bad question, it's, in my opinion, it's not a helpful question, which is why I don't think we ever see Joseph ask it. But there is something Joseph does have something that he does do very intentionally. And I think it's why he never asks the question why. It's the one word, perspective. Perspective. We're going to fast forward. You'll hear this again next week. 22 years. He was beaten, left for dead, then sold into slavery at the age of 17. 22 years later, Joseph sees his brothers again. Now, I can imagine there was a lot of things he would want to say to his brothers 22 years after that. Here's what he says to his brothers 22 years after, never asking why, but here's what he says to them. Genesis 50, verse 20. You, talking to his brothers, you intended to harm me, but God. And anytime you see those two words in scripture, but God, buckle up because you're about to see God do something incredible. We're about to in get insight into who God is and how he works. So you brothers intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Perspective. See, Joseph saw things differently, very differently. And when we see things differently, we don't ask why so much. Instead, we say, God, wonder what you're doing. Instead of asking why, it's, God, where are you and what are you doing? What might you be planning? 
Now, we can change our perspective. That's the good thing. Remember what Victor said earlier? If you can't change all of this, we'll be challenged to change here. Perspective is something that we can change. Even right here, right now, you have a very different perspective than I do. You're sitting down facing me. We're in the same room. If you're watching online, we have a very different perspective because you're at home or you're on a couch or you're with family or friends and, and you're seeing something that I'm not seeing. So you have one perspective, I have another perspective. If I wanna change my perspective, I have to do something, don't I? I have to move. So if I'm gonna change my perspective, I'm gonna come over here. And I've changed my perspective slightly. If I wanna change my perspective again, I move to the other side. And all of a sudden that perspective has adjusted and changed once again. If you wanna keep changing your perspective, all you do is you keep moving. If I sit down, I change my perspective. Not much because I'm so short. So from standing to sitting, there's not much of a difference there. If I turn around, oh, my perspective changes drastically. And I look and say, oh, this is what you're looking at. How do you sit here for an hour? <laughs> things change if you stand up. All of a sudden, yes, it does change. Wow, things change. It looks different. You're gaining a different perspective, but it requires us to move because perspective is based on your location, where you are. So let me ask that question, but with a spiritual tone to it. Where are you with God right now? Because that's gonna tell you where your perspective is. If your perspective is based on just you and your plans, you're going to be asking why a lot. Why is this happening? Why is this not happening? Why is it not happening now? If your perspective is from God's perspective, you're going to be looking for his purpose in everything. You get hand in the lemon, and instead of why, it's, God, I wonder what you're doing. God, what, what do you want to do with me? What, what are you going to do in me? God, how is this going to be, be worked into me and my family? And God, I wonder what the but God is going to be because of this lemon. Let me ask you the question this way. Are you viewing your life from the perspective of your plans or God's purpose? Are you currently viewing, do you have a perspective where you're viewing life from the perspective of your plans, my plan, we love to plan. Here's what I'm gonna do, and here's how I'm gonna do it, and here's what I'm gonna do, and here's what it's gonna look like. Remember all those expectations, which is why we get disappointed a whole lot. And when things don't work out, you get handed a lemon. You guys, well, why didn't it work? I thought I did everything I was supposed to, and I, I did this, and I did that, and I made sure, and it's not working out the way that I thought. Lemon disappointed. Oh, but when we live life and view life from the perspective of God's purpose, all of a sudden we're looking for how he works and how he moves, how he develops and grows us, how he leads us, how he uses us. May we look at life and lemons from God's perspective of purpose rather than just our perspective of our plans. So instead of asking the question why, let me give you three questions to ask instead. Here they are. Here's the first one. What is in my control? Great question to just ask. <laughs> because I can't change a lot of things, but I can change some things. So what is in my control? You'll see on the screen at home and in here, there's different scripture references. That's your homework this week. I want you to go through and spend some time reading those references. That's going to be helpful into at least the first one. What's in my control? Well, we're told, Philippians chapter four gives us some great insight into things that are in our control. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. Wait, did you say always? You mean even when I get handed a lemon? Oh yeah. Even when my plans don't work out the way that I thought? Oh yeah. Even in the midst of the difficulties and the struggles and the issues and the adversity? Yes, 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 always. He goes on to tell us what we should think about. That's in our control. Our mind is still in our control. So we think of these things. Whatever is pure, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is admirable, whatever is lovely, anything that is praiseworthy, think of those things. Okay. What's in your control? Instead of worrying about everything that's not, focus on what is in your control. Ask that question. Use Philippians 4 as a guide so you can take control of what you should. Again, that's what Victor told us. Like, challenge here. Be challenged here. Second question. How can I grow from this? That's even a, a worldview, not just a biblical or a Christian view. That is a worldview. Because we've heard this phrase before, whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Because we know that difficulties have a way of developing us, that struggles have a way of producing things in us. So when they got that from the Bible, just so you know, that wasn't like a smart person. That was God that said, here's how I'm going to work in your life. Here's how I'm going to develop you. Here's how I'm going to produce things in you. I'm going to give you lemons, and guess what? I'm going to watch you grow and flourish. 
James chapter one talks about this. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds. Wait, I should be joyful when I get handed lemons. Yes, why? Because it produces things in you. It develops you. James goes on to tell us so that we are not lacking in anything. No, we're complete and mature. See, God has a desire for who he wants you to be. The man and woman of God, he desires you to be. And it takes lemons to get you there. It takes difficulties to grow those things in you. It takes problems for you to overcome that he does with you and through you and in you. So who are you growing me to be? How are you developing me right now, God? This situation, this lemon that life has thrown at me, how can I grow from it? Last question. Who can I help because of it? One of the neatest parts of Joseph's story is all the difficulties that Joseph went through got him to a place where he helped. Spoiler, because that's next week, so don't think too much on that one. That's a huge part of Joseph's story, is how can I help even when things aren't going well? How can I help even when things have happened to me? I do want to read this verse for you out of 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Listen to how God works. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. The God of all comfort. So in all of our difficulties, he promises to comfort us. Look at how that happens. It's the God of all comfort who comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. Do you see how God works? The God of all comfort comforts you in your struggles, in your troubles, in your problems, in your issues with your lemons. And then he says, now guess what? The way I comforted you, I want you to comfort someone else. So whatever you have faced, the disappointments, the betrayals, or fill in the blank with that, whatever they are, when someone else gets handed that same or similar lemon, guess what you get to do? Comfort them. Man, I've been there. Man, I get it. Let me encourage you. Let me point you to Jesus. Let me show you how Jesus walked alongside me. Let me show you what Jesus did through that. As you have been comforted by God, the Father of compassion, the God of comfort, you then get to comfort someone else. That's why we do what we do. That's how it works. So instead of asking why, ask those questions. What's in my control? How can I grow from this? And who can I help because of this? I had a middle school pastor that said this phrase all the time. Some of you is probably gonna be pretty familiar. He said it in youth group nights. He said it on trips. He said it on events. He said, anytime I was around him, I heard this phrase and it was just kind of his phrase and it stuck with me that was from middle school years and it stuck with me he said all the time God is good all the time and all the time God is good it was kind of a little bit of an inside joke yeah yeah that's Scott's thing he says it but let me tell you that stuck with me to the point of any time I have a lemon and a difficulty guess what phrase is in my head God is still good all the time and all the time he's still good Sometimes as we get older, it's hard to understand how God could be so good in the midst of these difficulties. Let me read this, and this is where we're going to end Joseph's story today, and we'll pick it up again next week. So he was originally left for dead, then he was sold to the Ishmaelites. Here's where we pick it up in Genesis chapter 39, verse 1. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. Verse 2. The Lord was with Joseph. God is good all the time. And all the time, he is good. Just as God was with Joseph during all of that, he's with you. He promises that. Jesus' words are, take heart. <laughs> I've overcome the world. No, I've told you these things, he says, because I want you to have peace and you will have trouble. But he says, I have overcome the world, so you don't have to. He says, I'm with you. No matter what you've been handed, he is with you. And here's just something incredible about our God. Our God. And as your pastor, I wish I had a really great way to explain this, but I don't. So here it is. God has a way of making bad things good. Doesn't mean those bad things are good. It means he turns them into something 
good. He has a way of taking the most horrific parts of your past and turning them in to your redemptive story of his love and his grace and his forgiveness. He has a way of taking your most difficult trials and struggles and problems and turning them into the most greatest part of your growth and who you are today. He just has a way of taking the terrible and turning them into something great for his glory and his name. He took the cross, and now we celebrate it. We celebrate him for it. He took death and used it to give us life. So what do you do with your limits? You ask those questions, and you keep looking for the but God. What might God be doing? I'm looking for your purpose and your will and what you might do in and through me. But it begins with acknowledging that he is with you. If Jesus Christ isn't the Lord and Savior, the king of your life, you start there. Or else none of this is going to make sense. He's got to be the Lord. He's got to be the Savior of your life so that you follow him and his purposes instead of just making all of your plans. At home or here in the room, if you'll close your eyes and bow your head with me, I want to give you a moment to respond in whatever way you need to. If Jesus is not your Lord and Savior yet, you start there. You say something along the lines of, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Jesus, I need a Savior. You are my Savior. I need your grace. I need your forgiveness. And I accept it, not because of anything I've done to earn it or deserve it, but because you willingly give it. Jesus, thank you for saving me. Jesus, thank you for forgiving me and giving me the gift of eternal life that begins now. If you've already made Jesus your Lord and your Savior, your prayer is, God, help me to see your purposes. Help me to chase after your purpose, no matter what. Jesus, we come before you, recognizing the difficulties of our life, the lemons that life hands us, but may we, instead of filling up our mouths with the question why may we fill it with our praise for you because we know you're working and we know you're doing something we sang it earlier even when we don't see it we know that you're working even when we don't feel it we know that you are working so we praise you because you are good all the time even when life is not you still are help us to chase after you wholeheartedly because you are good in jesus name amen